So I want to start off with a two prong question for you. First one is what is Buddhism? You know, fastball right up the middle for you. And mm -hmm. the other part is why did you decide to follow this path so earnestly? You know, why did you decide to become a monk in the Theravada mm -hmm. Buddhist tradition? Yeah, those are, uh, those are good questions. Yeah, so basically Buddhism, it was a religion founded in India about uh, 2,500 years ago. And it has a very interesting history. So, you know, now, I guess, you know, westernized country, America, Canada, there's this ideal of having many different players competing that kind of elevate the game. You know, so different printing companies or different whatever kinds of companies will ideally compete on a level playing field. And through this competition, they try to find the best way to make a printer, the best way to make whatever it might be. In ancient India, 2,500 years ago, that same dynamic existed, but with religions. And, you know, all human endeavors are kind of similar. Everybody's looking for happiness. You know, the, the Western style is to try to find it by making the material world as comfortable as possible. So the best printer, <laughs> the best TV, whatever it might be. In ancient India, it was, the same, it was the same pursuit, but they were trying to do it spiritually. So just like now, you'd have these different companies like HP and you know, whatever else, Canon competing to make the best printers or whatever it might be. In those days, you had different schools, philosophical schools. And these philosophical schools would compete through debate, through attracting students, and you know, through their reputation to try to find the best way to overcome suffering, basically. And so the Buddha arose in this kind of milieu, in this kind of cultural milieu, this cultural situation. And at that time, there was all these different competing schools, but the idea had basically come about that there was this cycle that kept going on and on and on, and it was very difficult to get out of. <laughs> the cycle of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. So they had this cyclical view rather than this linear view that was developed in the Western religions. And this was seen as something really, really terrible by almost all the schools that adopted the view. There were some school, there was at least one school that was materialist. They basically believed there's no life after death. So in the time of the Buddha, you had basically every philosophy possible represented, more or less. You know, you, you, you know, can't say in the, in the specifics, but like in the broad strokes, Basically, every religious philosophy was represented in India at that time. So the Buddha arose in this milieu. He, he decided he wanted to go forth to find a way to end suffering. And he was, a very, he was the son of a very, very wealthy man and had all the advantages and uh, even was married and had a son. And he renounced it all and started to try to find a way to end suffering. The thing was, at his time... You know, there's kind of no certainty that there really was a way. And you have all these competing schools saying that they've found a way. So first of all, the Buddha started, he went to different teachers and tried to learn their methods. He learned them and he was successful, but he was dissatisfied with it. He basically learned concentration methods. Then he went all the way to the other extreme. <laughs> and he decided, well, it's going to be through completely denying any form of pleasure that I can find, he decided I can find release from the cycle of birth and death. So he did a lot of extreme things. He, he basically fasted. He would eat like one grain of rice a week, one grain of rice, even up to a fortnight. And then he would try it with different foods like fruits, like one grain, one tiny, uh, I think myrobalan fruit a day, or, and then he would keep extending it up to two weeks. And because of these austerities that he was doing, he became so emaciated, so thin that if he touched his stomach, it would touch his back bone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And his hair became so rotted that if he rubbed his hair, it would fall out at the roots. But he still didn't find what he was looking for. So then he, realized, he remembered this time when he was a very young man and he was sitting under a tree. And sitting under this tree, he, he achieved what they call a john. And he thought... Is this the way to enlightenment? And then realize that's the way, because he'd been trying all these austerities. So then he decided that he would take some solid food because having this really weak body, you couldn't achieve jhanas. So he took some solid food and his companions got so disgusted with him that they left. And 
it's very funny actually later on in the in the canon he meets with them again and they use this kind of like insulting language when he first meets them so they were totally disgusted with him so now he has nothing he's renounced his home he's renounced his wife he's renounced his fame he has very poor health and he made this determination, I'm going to sit down and I won't arise from this seat unless I achieve enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so then he actually, through that determination and through having explored every other avenue, it seems basically, he actually was able to find this way to enlightenment, which was the middle path. So it's the middle path between extreme sensuality on the one hand, and this kind of torturous fasting and self-mortification on the other. So. This kind of middle path is something that resonates even up to this day because it's not something that requires an extreme faith in like a creator God or anything like this. It's something that people have to investigate and realize for themselves, essentially by following in the Buddhist footsteps. And so as a young man, to answer your second question, I was um, always kind of looking for what it was that could make me happy. I kind of was interested in happiness quite a lot. Are when I was in grade seven, uh, our teacher asked the class, she's like, what do you think? What do you think the purpose of life is? And I put up my hand and I said, well, I think the purpose of life is to be happy. And she said, well, you know, no, that's a wrong answer. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but I was totally convinced by this answer. So as a young man, I decided that I was going to try to find a way to be happy. And I thought that was my purpose in life. And so I, I did some extreme things for this, you know, because I would look around and see, well, who's happy now? You know, well, maybe it's the class clown who's happy. So I try to be the class clown. Well, who's happy now? It's this person who's happy. Then I try to get whatever they had. And so I was going through my life with this philosophy, but it, it was really not going anywhere. And so what actually happened was I was very anti-religious at that time. I didn't really believe in any religions. I thought they were all just made up and false. And so I was also a young man. I was 18 at that time, and I was looking for a girlfriend. So my mother, she bought me this book called If the Buddha Dated. And it was meant to be a joke. <laughs> because I didn't like other religions. And so in order to spark debate, sometimes I would say I was a Buddhist. I didn't know anything about Buddhism. I just knew it had reincarnation. So I would just say this to kind of prod people. I was a little bit of a, you know, I was a little bit of a mischief maker, I guess you could say. I kind of like to debate. So I never thought I would read this book um, because it was a joke and I didn't have any interest in religion. But as it turned out, there was one day I had nothing to read. So I just started flipping through this book randomly and just no interest really, just flipping through it. And I came to this section that said, um, this is the central tenet of Buddhism, the central teaching, the Four Noble Truths. So before I read it, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to debate with this. You know, I'm going to hu see huge flaws in this and that'll be it. So I went through and I read the Four Noble Truths and after finishing them, I was converted. <laughs> so so mm -hmm. rather than me kind of um, completely finding holes and flaws in Buddhist philosophy, I was completely unable to find flaws. And what's more, uh, what I found in the Four Noble Truths, what I found in that philosophy was uh, was basically um, was basically the intellectual answer to what I'd been searching for for all these years, which was uh, a path to happiness, a path to a permanent uh, happiness. Mm. So that was how I became a Buddhist. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, I believe that is something we all yearn for: is to enjoy this life, to be happy in this life. I don't even know if happiness is the right word, but yeah, find some sort of peace while we're here, right? Um, do you say that the middle way is the only way to this said happiness? Um, is, are there other ways or is the eightfold path the only path to find this peace, happiness, joy in our lives? I mean, there was one time, <laughs> it's kind of funny, when I was a young man, uh, I had a girlfriend and she took me back to meet her parents and her parents were very strong Christians. She was Arabic. And one of the first things her mother asked me is, what religion? Are you? And I said, I'm a Buddhist. She mm -hmm. said, well, what do Buddhists want? And I said, well, we're looking for happiness. And she said, well, you can find happiness by turning on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, no. <laughs> 
And, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of truth to that, actually. I mean, there is a certain type of happiness that people can find by turning on the TV. There is happiness that people can find by giving, right? Like giving gifts. That's very strong in many religions, the giving of gifts. There is happiness that people can find through meditation. And that's especially strong in Hinduism and certain forms of Christianity and, you know, mystical forms of Islam and probably in many other religions too. I mean, I can't, I'm not familiar with every religion. But as far as Buddhism goes, the complete Noble Eightfold Path is said to be something that's only found in the Buddhist teachings. So, um, the closest that you can come is actually there was this big fight between Hinduism and Buddhism post-Buddhism. About a few hundred years after Buddhism um, started, it became the dominant religion in India. And what happened was there was this huge pushback by resurgent Hinduism, which actually ended up being one of the big factors that ended Buddhism in India. And the pushback against Buddhism, what it did was Hinduism tried to take as many things from the Buddhist teachings as possible to eliminate as much of a distinction as possible. So you have this, these responses in the Yoga Sutras. You've got the eight limbs of yoga. Mm -hmm. That's a response to the Noble Eightfold Path. You've got Advaita Vedanta. That's a response to the mind-only school of Buddhism. So that's as close oh, as you can that. get. Wow. Yeah, basically, yeah. Advaita Vedanta was started by Adi Shankara, and his grand teacher was a Buddhist monk. But we, we can't say it only went one way. Buddhism also, through uh, Nalanda University, adopted a lot of concepts from Hinduism. But long and short of it is, just to cut to the chase, that even in this case, which is the most extreme attempts to adopt everything from Buddhism, you still have this break in which... In Hinduism, they're essentially looking for a permanent self. And in Buddhism, it's a deconstructive path. The Noble Eightfold Path is deconstructive. People say it's that way in Hinduism too. But I think even Adi Shankara, who came the closest to taking everything that he could from Buddhism, basically, um, he admitted that there was this difference between Buddhism and Hinduism in the attitudes towards the self. So, in Buddhism, basically what it's seen is that this path that leads to Nibbana, Nibbana means the putting out of a flame, basically, is only found in the teachings of the Buddha Gautama. So, that's not to be like very sectarian or like uh, down on other religions, right? I mean, it's just, that's the way that it's, it tends to be seen. That's, it's there explicitly in the sutta. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is interesting. Hinduism is trying to find the self with a capital S, the all-encompassing self. And Buddhism is the other side of the coin with a nata, trying to deconstruct the self, you know. Um, I do feel as though they're just two sides of the same coin, though, like I said. They may be different in theory, but I do feel as though they're both uh, seeking nirvana or nibbana it's just different perspectives on the same uh the same essence you could say would you say that you know the theory is different but in practice in the modalities in the path are similar as in the way that we carry ourselves in our lifestyle and the actual you know the energy put forth toward the cessation of suffering no matter if we do believe in a self or no self, it's, uh, it's similar in that way, in the way that we actually live our lives. Definitely, we could say it's similar. Yeah, so um, what is it to you that, what is it to you about Buddhism that is maybe superior or more efficient than, say, the practice of Advaita Vedanta or Raja Yoga? Um, what is it about this path that was more attractive to you to follow that if the name of the game is the cessation of suffering what was it more attractive why was it more attractive in aiding you in the cessation of suffering and liberation for you in the end well i i'm not at the end <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully someday maybe in the next life or the next life but why do you think this is the most efficient way to go about this well for me I basically encountered Buddhism first, more or less. Oh, I see. So mm -hmm. um, that and Buddhism basically addressed that question head on. 
more mm-hmm. or less, right? Like, I think Raja Yoga, I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm, here I'm going to get out of my element a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep my comments basic because I don't know the philosophy in depth. But my understanding of Raja Yoga, and you probably have a lot more understanding, is that they're, at least from one of the books that I read, they're, they're looking for a union with Brahma to a certain extent, like a very kind of a, a static, ecstatic um, union. Mm-hmm. And that's there in Buddhism too. So jumping back to your other point, um, there is a lot of similarities between these, obviously. They're, they're all from the same cultural background and they were in this, you know, there's similarities between a Canon printer and an HP printer, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they get to competing with each other. <laughs> so that is there in Buddhism. It's called jhana. In Buddhism, this is called jhana. It's called the imperturbable concentration. And some of these concentrations were the first ones that the Buddha did. And he later incorporated them into his path. So they're, they're not a bad thing, what we might call Raja Yoga. So that is not seen as something bad in Buddhism. Actually, it does lead to rebirth in what they call the, the Brahma realms. And it's a good thing. So here we're not talking about like, you know, some religions, like especially some uh, religion will, will classify other religions almost as if they're totally evil. Like you, you go our way or the highway, basically. You, it's, yeah. You're either with us or you're against us. Mm-hmm. Indian religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, yoga, they don't have that same flavor. They, they more have the, the flavor of a philosophical debate where there's differences between them and the differences are seen as important. But as you said, what overlaps is much greater. So jumping on to Advaita Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, from my understanding, uh, from what I've read and talked with other people about, this was the most direct challenge to Buddhism. In fact, Advaita Vedanta and Adi Shankara arguing with Buddhist monks, especially I think of the Yogacara school, the mind only school, he was able to basically defeat Buddhism in India. It was crushed out of existence through uh, a resurgent Hinduism led by Advaita Vedanta and Adi Shankara on one hand and Muslim invasions on the other, which they Mm. really didn't like Buddhism. So from that, Buddhism got wiped out of India to the extent that when the British came, they thought he was a, a fictional being. So Advaita Vedanta is the most direct challenge, but what it essentially does is it, it's doing the same thing um, as, so it's, it's coming at it from a different angle and it's looking for like a stable self. Mm-hmm. And when we break down, you're talking about the lifestyle practices. Actually, what in Buddhism, Raja Yoga, what the, like the, the deep states of jhana, these are what you might call like more meritorious from the Vaita practitioners that I've known. It's more like a kind of just going back to a a normal type of awareness. So in Buddhism, so when you look at the theories between Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism, the theories seem really similar. When you get down to the actual practices, the way that they're practiced, like Advaita Vedanta tends to be, from what I've heard, this kind of trying to be aware, be the knowing in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And so in Buddhism, this is classified as vinyana kanda. It's actually not something that's considered that you know, I don't want to. I don't want to oversimplify Advaita Vedanta. There may be some people achieving very deep states of meditation there, but um, just from the interactions that I've had, from what I've heard, and from what I've seen, it, it's what we would call in Buddhism vinyana kanda. So it's not even like a jhana. It's not a deeper state of meditation. It is beneficial because if you are not reacting to things, if you're just observing them, that's good. Right? Mm-hmm. Like that's not bad. But where Buddhism would differ from Raja Yoga, from Advaita Vedanta, is that even these states of jhana that the Buddha first achieved and then remembered, oh, this is the path, those things fortify what we call wisdom. And what wisdom is doing, it's not a philosophical proposition about what a self is and what's not a self. It's looking where people are attaching to and what they're feeding on to create their identity. So this is what a self means in Buddhism. Whenever you have something you like, whenever you have something you're feeding on, you're creating an identity from that. And because the identity is impermanent, you're gonna suffer when it changes. So in order to really let go of that, you have to have a calm mind, you have to have something better than the identities you're creating. So that's where the jhanas come in. But at the end, even these jhanas are created. So the Buddha has this simile of a raft, like the Dhamma is a raft, you bind the raft together, and when you get to the further shore, you let go even of the raft. 
So at the end of the path, the path even deconstructs to the point where it deconstructs the Dhamma itself. You let go even of your attachment to the Buddha's teachings, and then people can find something that's unconditioned. So in Buddhist terms, this is seen as something um, that is the end of suffering, and it differs from Advaita Vedanta, this kind of, at least what I've heard, there may be people achieving deeper states of meditation with that, but just the normal being aware through the daily life, it differs radically from that. It differs radically even from these deep jhanas that are recommended in Raja Yoga. It's something unconditioned. So from a Buddhist perspective, that's how it would be. Of course, other religions would have different perspectives, right? But <laughs> no, I get that. So the main differing point, I speak to a lot of Vaita Vedanta people, so this is really interesting to me. And I actually am mm -hmm. on the, more on the side of Buddhism. It's like, yeah, I get it. Um, be here now, just rest as awareness, and countless different buzzwords that they use to guide people toward the here and now, and, you know, the simple presence of I am that I am, right? And it seems like it almost skips over some steps to this. If there is a goal of liberation or Nibbana, it almost like skips over steps and seems like a sort of bypassing when you approach the practice in that way. Um, it's definitely beneficial but there's a little bit more work to do per se, right? Is that a decent description? Um, well, maybe you could elaborate a bit more on the bypassing part. Um, yeah. I didn't fully catch it. Yeah. So Buddhism outlines like, you know, a way of life in order to uh, live the Dhamma pretty much. When Advaita Vedanta doesn't really give you any prescription, uh, you know, teachers or guides they say do nothing. There's nothing you have to do per se, which is true. I can see that point. But that in a way could be looked at as like a sort of mm, passiveness or even nihilism to one's practice to negate the practice. Like to, um, if there's nothing to do, it's all here and now. Rest as awareness. You're perfect as you are. From that, I could see a no a non-change in lifestyle coming about, which could negate some of the stages or some of the jhanas that one could truly attain in liberation. So you, you know what I mean by bypassing in that way? So it's sort of like, uh, yeah, you're good. There's nothing you have to do when a Buddhist, especially like you and as earnest as you would say, no, there's still there's still steps that you have to take. It's um. I forget the poly word that you use, but it's a, it's one point in, it's one stage in the journey per se to liberation, but it's not, uh, it's not the end goal. It's not the entire journey. Yeah. You know? That's a good description. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's interesting though. Like you said, at the end, the Buddhist has to sort of let go of the Dharma. So it is, it seems like, Advaita Vedanta is pure in that way. You do have to let go of practice, let go of the Dharma. There's nothing you have to do. But it seems like the practice of Buddhism through the Eightfold Path is what bridges the gap between the end goal and where you're at. When Advaita Vedanta tries to bridge the gap through um, skipping stages of what one has to do in order to harness this in their life you know what i'm getting at like this uh yeah 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 so if it was as easy as just watching so what i'm saying is if it was as easy as just watching a youtube video <laughs> and saying and just hearing somebody repeat that you know endless buzzwords of there's nothing you have to do all is good you're perfect as it is and then you shut off the youtube video and you reach nibbana um, we'd have a lot more arhats and enlightened beings, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I could see that it's definitely a noble pursuit and a noble um, point of guidance, but that's not the whole path, you know. That's not like that's not everything you need to do per se. Like it's like um, yeah, it's a sort of bypassing. I see. I see it as it's almost like you're negating the things in the the true path to this liberation. Um, if you right, to, right. Yeah. Well, you know, go ahead. Yeah, no, go on, go on. Yeah. I was just going to say you're negating the, um, you're negating the true path toward liberation. If you do follow Advaita Vedanta too closely, it definitely has positive attributes to it in its teachings, but it's not the whole package. I see Buddhism as, um, the whole package essentially. 
almost like if life is a game, it is the comprehensive strategy guide in order to <laughs> attain this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think Buddhists would agree. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think uh, Advaita Vedantists would agree. But, no. you know, it's interesting you brought that up because with this simile of the raft, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have to let go of the raft. Mm -hmm. But first you have to build it. Yes. And then you've got to use it to paddle across the shore. It's only yeah. when you get to the other side, when person gets to the other side, they let it go. It, mm -hmm. If you let go of the raft while you're still on this shore, you're not going anywhere, right? <laughs> or, you know. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> so that's the simile that... Um, that Buddhists often use because actually these concepts, these ideas of just letting go, just being awareness, those creep into Buddhism too, now that Buddhism has come to the West. So there's, uh -huh. there's yeah. actually a bit of a, how to say, a back and forth pushback in Buddhism itself over this very issue. Yeah. So those are the differences between Vedanta and Buddhism, right? But now I'd like to tackle the similarities or maybe the great similarity. I would say the great similarity is extinguishing the sense of self, the five aggregates, you know, all the pleasures and aversions and habits that come along with those, um, attachments that come along with those. I feel as though that is the goal. If there is an overarching goal between these philosophies, it's to extinguish the ego, essentially. Um, would you say that is accurate? Is there is that the similarity between them? They just have different ways and flavors to go about doing this in the practice. Um, well, yeah, I, that could be. Like I said, I'm 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 gonna. I don't want to get on too shaky ground and try to speak for Advaita Vedantas or speak for Raja Yoga people because I I'm not totally versed in their. I'm not well versed in their philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, but probably my guess, just from my readings of them and, you know, from, from Indian philosophy in general, they would probably agree with that statement. But like I said, where Buddhism comes in is it wouldn't see these as different flavors. You can view them as different paths, right? Yeah. Like, and, and some paths lead to the goal, other ones don't. So that's where Buddhism comes in. Some lead further along, some travel together for a longer time. But like I said, in Buddhism, the view is that only the Buddha's teachings lead all the way. Yeah. Because actually, there was, represented, there was representations of these types of theories you, you, one can see or uh, imagine. There was representations of these types of theories at the time of the Buddha. And the Buddha was not, he didn't like set out to, initially, he didn't set out necessarily. He looked for teachers first. Mm -hmm. It was when he didn't find teachers that he had to invent it himself. So in Buddhism, it's seen that Buddhism is the path to Nibbana. Although, philosophically, I'm sure if you ask members of Buddhism, Advaita Vedanta, and Raja Yoga, you know, are you trying to eliminate um, your conceit I am? They say asmi mana, and there's probably similar words in Sanskrit, too, that they even use. Mm -hmm. They would probably all say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the name of the game, is being a little less uh, selfish, right? And... Uh... Sort of surrender, that's a buzzword, surrendering to um, something greater, maybe, and almost looking at it as a science to extract the selfish habits and, uh, yeah, extract the selfish habits that lead to suffering, right? Because essentially, you know, liberation, freedom from suffering is freedom from our own self-imposed suffering, right? Like we're doing this to ourselves, and we just don't mm -hmm. know how to go about it. Um, so when we let go of the inhibitions of the ego, that's how we sort of satiate suffering. And Buddhism is... In my point of view, and definitely yours, the most powerful strategy to go about this, if there is, you know, a means to go about, um, I guess, killing the ego, if you want to even say it that, or becoming a little less selfish in our actions, Buddhism is the step-by-step -step process and guide to go about this so that we stop essentially creating suffering for ourselves. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I think uh, Buddhists would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I agree too. This is something about Buddhism that I'm into all religions, but there's just something about Buddhism mm-hmm. that is so just on point. It's just very, very different. And I wouldn't even call it a religion, to be honest. I wouldn't even group it in with anything else. It's like, there's all the other isms and then there's Buddhism. There's something just <laughs> like, there's, there's something different about it. Um, what was my point of my story here? Oh, so yeah. Would you say that ultimately if one is following the Buddhist path, if this is the most efficient way to satiate suffering, that becoming a monk is the most efficient way of the most efficient way? As in, you know, if all roads lead to Buddhism, do all roads also lead to becoming a monastic in Buddhism? Um, well, I, I wouldn't say that all roads lead to Buddhism. <laughs> some lead to <laughs> well, following the Buddha's words, right? Because I think you said that before, like eventually all philosophies are going to find that following the Buddha's words is the way, like his teachings and his ways of life, right? Yeah, well, um, well, in Buddhism, basically, it's going to depend on that person, right? Like it, it, there, there was a sutta actually where somebody asked the Buddha, they said, when the Buddha teaches the Noble Eightfold Path, will all of the cosmos attain liberation or a half or a third? How much? Like when basically once the whole thing is done, the, the ball of string has been thrown and unrolled, mm-hmm. what percentage of the cosmos will attain Nibbana because of the Buddha's teachings? And the Buddha didn't answer. Hmm. And then the, the man, I think, asked two or three times. And then his attendant, Venerable Ananda, said, you know, you're not asking the right question. The Buddha doesn't focus on that. It's like... Hmm. Uh, he fo- imagine like a city that had one gate and a wise gatekeeper would know anybody who comes through this city is going to come through this gate. The, uh, the wall is so thick, even a cat can't get through any cracks. So any person who comes in has to come through this gate. And so what the Buddha focuses on is any person who wants to achieve Nibbana will go through the Noble Eightfold Path. But he doesn't say like that all people will eventually get there. It depends on their... It, it depends on whether they want to take up the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, and the, the second point, maybe you can just prompt me a bit about that last uh, question. That we, so that was one of them. I forgot already. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, I so, guess it was, um, it was all roads lead to Buddhism, right? Oh, yes. And then, so you said, you know, if somebody actually does want to follow the path. Um, now, if they do want to follow the path, is the does the path lead to monasticism? That's right. So that's a good question. So not necessarily. Um, in answer to your question, monasticism is seen as the most efficient route, mm-hmm. basically, like all, all everything else being equal. I mean, you can't say it's the most efficient route for everybody. Right? The, not everybody becomes a monk. So in the time of the Buddha, there was actually many lay people who got as far as what they call non-return. So that's the one right before our hunchet. Mm-hmm. And when they pass away, their next life will be their last life and they'll be in a Brahma heaven. So for those people, they'll never become monks. <laughs> they'll achieve Nibbana without ever having become a monk. But the Buddha set up this mode of life, this monastic mode of life as being the most conducive mode to strive for Nibbana. So in that sense, it's the best opportunity that one could get. You can see that if you start to try to practice as a lay person really sincerely, a lot of things get in the way. You've got to make money, you know, you've got to do this and that. And then you're in a culture surrounded by people who don't have the same values, right? I mean, you're going to see you're going to start to seem pretty weird at a certain point. If you start meditating more than four hours a day, you're going to start losing friends. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's it's going to be hard to maintain your work. So if you join the Sangha, you're with a whole group of people who are supported and expected to do just that. They're expected to meditate. They're expected to teach. They're not expected to be married. So in that way, it's extremely supportive. Mm, Interesting. But the thing is, you can't force it, right? So you actually have to really want to become a monk is what you're saying. Like we all have karma to work through. And uh, if it hasn't been worked through, then becoming a monk wouldn't be for that person. Like you almost have to, you almost have to fade into monkship, you know, like you can't just like wake up one day and become a monk. It almost has to be something that we work toward in our lay life. And then maybe personally speaking, you can speak on your life. 
we work toward in our lay life and then someday we figure out that hey this world isn't really conducive to uh to my practice so becoming a monk is has to become it's almost like an ultimatum it's like you have to become a monk right you you have to do this based upon the practices that you established in your lay life like becoming a monk is just like the next step in the process to that um would you say that's an accurate description yeah yeah i'd say it can be um it all depends on that person's path but what you described is probably a pretty accurate one for most westerners yeah because there's it's hard no, describing generalizations no, yeah yeah it's it's um in the West, right, where we're both from, there's no cultural support for Buddhism, really. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, most people are converts. So what that means is that they're going to be testing the waters bit by bit. They're going to be seeing, do I like this intellectually first, reading books about it usually. Then they're going to start to practice and see, does this practice bring results? Mm. And then finally, there's probably going to be a tipping point if they decide to become a monk, where usually what happens with Westerners is at first they use Buddhism to supplement their lay life. Like yeah. they're using it to be less stressed, more efficient at work, get better relationships. But at a certain point, there can be a tipping point where instead of Buddhism supplementing their lay life, their lay life gets in the way of their practice of Buddhism. Ah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I can so see that. At that point, people will start, may decide to become a monk. Right? Mm, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's how I feel. I feel like I'm gradually going into monkship. I don't feel like I'm there yet. Like I wouldn't be able to, I mean, I would be able to. It's just uh, I got attachments. I'm not going to lie. Got attachments. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's almost like I know if I were to snap my fingers and, you know, join the monastic, uh, the monastic order tomorrow, <laughs> as we described, it's the most efficient way, right? I would be dumb not to. I believe in the Buddha's words. I got Buddha right here. I believe I read a lot of suttas myself, but I feel as though it's not right at this time. Like I would, I would just fall out of it. I'd do it for a week and be like, this ain't it. I don't know. There's uh, this is attachment. <laughs> so I do feel like it's like I'm slowly fading into it. Maybe, maybe a few years, few months, who knows? But that was kind of like a question for me personally but there's probably a lot of other people also on this wavelength that are listening you know they're like they're treading on monkship they're wondering if it's like the right way for them but you're saying it's not for everybody but you will slowly start to find out when it is for you let me ask you that when did you um you know when did you make the transition yourself was there like one day where the revelation came upon you and said, yep, I'm donning the robes, I'm moving to Sri Lanka. <laughs> you know, like, how did this come about? Yeah, well, it was, it would graph in basically the way that we were describing. I, mm -hmm. I actually had no idea that I would become a monk and actually didn't even want to at first. Mm -hmm. I, I had no kind of interest. Actually, I had a lot of suffering when I was young and I wanted to find a way to alleviate the suffering and Buddhism was the answer. And even after I'd found Buddhism, I agreed and believed that Nibbana was the final answer, but I didn't have like an interest in being a professional Buddhist in this yeah. life. I thought, yeah. well, next, next life. That's what <laughs> yeah. I it's always next life. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so what ended up happening was that, as I said, I was using Buddhism to supplement my life. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was, it, Buddhism can be very effective in supplementing your life and giving you the, the psychological benefits that people are looking for. But there was this one time that I was, I went on a retreat. And by this point, I was already living in a temple and going to university. So gradually things had started to fall away. So I moved into a temple and I was taking their part-time priest training program. It mm -hmm. was a Zen temple. Mm -hmm. And I was in university for business. And I was loving, I loved university, but I was living in this temple. It was a quiet place, good place to study. And in any event, one time I went on this retreat at the temple, and after the retreat, that was when I, as far as I recall, this thought came, wait a minute, I'm getting more happiness from these retreats uh, than I am from business school. Uh, and I uh -huh. loved business school. So mm -hmm. it was a tipping point. So at that point, I mean, it's a choice, right? You have this kind of intuition. This is what happened. This is the right thing to do. And you can try to cover it up or you can go for it. I was terrified, mm -hmm. actually, to ordain. It wasn't like an easy decision. And I got, you know, 
actually had a really a good job offer at that time. I had to turn it. I felt like I was going mad, actually, to be honest. It's kind of turning down this job offer. And, you know, I don't know why I'm, why am I going to join this temple? I don't want to join this temple. <laughs> but I, I had this strong intuition, I guess you'd say that I had to. So actually, to be honest, I ran away from it for about three months or, you know, three months, six months, I got freaked out. I was like, this is weird. I'm leaving. <laughs> so I left, mm -hmm. but it was just always bubbling up. It was, it caused too many problems. So eventually I came back and I quit school <clears throat> And uh, then joined this temple, in kind of very uncertain future. So it was, <laughs> it was this, it was yeah. It wasn't like this, um, like you read about in the biographies of the great, you know, like the great Indian yogis who have this very strong determination, and everybody's trying to stop them, and they just still have this powerful will, and they just bash through it. Mm -hmm. For me, it was this very gradual process, and even the moment when I felt like this is the right time, I got scared. You know, I, I did quit this. I did refuse this job, but I, I didn't want to do it. I kind of ran away from it. But, you know, it's this inner battle. So eventually, like I said, after about six months, I came back and I've been here since. I've been in full time monastic um, training more or less since then. Mm. And how long have you uh, been a monk? I've been a monk for about 13 years. Wow. But before that, you have to be a Samanera for one year and an Anagark. So it's about 15 years total in Theravada. And yeah. then in Zen, it was about uh, four years of like part-time and full-time training. Wow. So about yeah. 20 years in the mix? About That's right. Yeah, about that. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. That's very impressive. Jeez. Wow. Well, it's, yeah. like, it's like a career, right? One day, one step at a time, and then 20 years has gone by. Yeah, <laughs> that is wild. It's the most worthy career, probably. Mm. Yeah, you probably wouldn't go back, right? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I basically, you can never say, right, as a monk. Uh, yeah. You can never say, like, uh, there's been monks who, you know, seem really, really excellent. I mean, monks who are extremely inspiring, extremely impressive, especially when you're a young monk coming up. And you think these guys will never disrobe and they do. Mm. And then a monk who you, you never think would remain a monk and nobody finds them impressive. They're still in robes and they're still practicing. Mm. So you can't really predict your future. Like, uh, you know, I'd be reluctant to make, I, I don't want to disrobe. I have no intention, you know, to go and disrobe uh, anything like this, but I think it's, it's not, um, it's not good for monks to make like, bravado statements about their future right because uh um you know like i said i've seen the best monks monks better than me disrobe <laughs> yeah wow so i have no intention i have no intention to do that but it's more like a one step at a time type thing mm. try to eliminate the defilements that are that are present uh you know that they're showing their heads right now those are the best ones to get rid of mm. Mm -hmm. yeah so what are um on that note what are the defilements? You know, I know there's a list. I don't know them off the top of my head. What, what are the most maybe uh, prevalent defilements for all of us that we have to get rid of? Well, there's three root ones. There's hatred, craving, and delusion. Mm. And so all the rest of the smaller ones, you know, anger, jealousy, lust, you know, um, everything. Anything you can list that's listed in the other religions and even ones that have no name. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. those all come under those three root delusions or those three root um defilements we call them kilesas mm. mm -hmm. so it basically means like a darkening kilesa means like a darkening of the it essentially has this image of like a darkening of the mind uh-huh and in those defilements we take unwise actions from that like uh you know, we become deluded, angry, envious. And from those emotional states, we act in a way that is uh, not sattvic, you could say, in a way that is maybe destructive to ourselves and other people. And that's what causes suffering. That is one way that you can say it, right? Like you've got the gross ones. So for example, if a person gets angry and they kill another person, obviously that has almost exclusively negative consequences. It's yeah. something everybody would agree is negative right? Mm -hmm. If a person gets very lustful, they sleep with another person's wife. Also very terrible consequences. 
where it gets interesting is that some of these defilements like craving or anger or whatever it might be, actually these have counterparts in the Pali words that are positive. So they have this word chanda. Chanda means desire. So in order to practice meditation, you have to have desire for it. You have to have a craving for it. Mm. It's the same quality, basically. It's just that you've turned it in a positive direction. So this is the building of the raft, right? Uh -huh. So almost many qualities, many of these negative qualities, they have to be turned to a positive direction in order to develop the Noble Eightfold Path. When they're in this purely negative form, they're in a form where they're destructive to our progress to Nibbana, then they're bad. When you turn them towards Nibbana, then they're better. Mm -hmm. But actually, even they're a problem, which is why at the end, even they have to be let go of. I see. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So yeah. the process of building the raft, would you say that is just um, in a basic way? Is that just through meditation? Not just meditation. So there's basically, it gets broken up in its most basic form into three. So sila, the keeping of morality. Mm -hmm. Samadhi, which is the jhanas that Raja Yoga talks about, and then Panya. So Panya is the wisdom faculty. Wisdom is seen what, as what separates. So these are the three phases. Both Samadhi and Panya can be meditation. There are meditation topics for them. But some monks who attain Nibbana, they, they attain Nibbana in the food line, <laughs> uh -huh. right? That's when, mm -hmm. that's when they attain our hunches. It's not necessarily when they're meditating in a formal way. It's that their mind is always looking for an opportunity to separate itself from its defilements. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, not exclusively meditation. I mean, in a formal sense, but in an informal sense, yes, the training of the mind. Maybe that'd be a more encompassing way to say it. Uh huh. Yeah. The training of the mind to have different intentions in our actions same attachments but a different intention in the attachment no no it's eventually to eliminate all attachments eventually yeah, all right. the all the att eventually. yeah that's right yeah it, eventually <laughs> that's right but how so we one start can off. see it as that's right yeah so one can see it as climbing a ladder kind of mm -hmm. that's one way to look at it so Yes, I guess you'd say like craving is what drives us to climb the ladder, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. craving, in a sense, is even a problem. So I think that's the point you're driving at there. So yes, yeah. that's, that's true. Um, but also there's this aspect of climbing the ladder where in order to get to a higher level, you've got to let go of the one, the one below. Mm -hmm. So in order to achieve the jhanas in Raja Yoga, right, people have to let go of their attachment to sensuality, at least temporarily. And if people want to achieve that anytime they want, their lifestyle can no longer be built around sensuality. It has to be built around sati, around meditation. Uh-huh. Yeah. So climbing the, the Buddhist path, like climbing a ladder, at the end you let go of the ladder, jump on the roof. Yeah. I think that's the important aspect of this whole thing is that um, letting go of craving, and correct me if I'm wrong, letting go of craving isn't necessarily when the craving comes about, as in, I get a craving for a cookie. Do I eat the cookie or not? Well, it depends on the situation. It's not really about that. It doesn't come in the movement. Like the, the cessation of craving is through the lifestyle, right? We, we don't get rid of it necessarily when it arises. We can, but would you say that also could cause suffering in itself if you don't act upon this craving for whatever it is? And tr to truly get rid of the craving and attachment, it's through the lifestyle that we build and the habits and rituals that we build in our life so that the craving for the cookie or whatever it is doesn't even come up. And that is the letting go of the ladder. It's through the life that we build. I think you hit on an important point. I mean, definitely the lifestyle is going to be one of the most important factors, right? Like if you go on a 10-day meditation retreat, at the end of 10 days, one goes back to doing the exact same things as before. Mm -hmm. It's not going to have that big of an impact. Yeah. Also, though, it is the case that these very small things, one is craving for the cookie. I mean, sometimes a cookie might be good for a person's body, right? Like, you know, there's, there can be time, like after donating blood or whatever it might be, your body might need some sugar. Might yeah. need, the cookie might not be bad. In situations where the cookie is bad to eat and you resist, not you, a person resists 
eating the cookie in that situation, this is actually what builds a habit and the habit builds a lifestyle. And the lifestyle builds essentially a character. A character builds a destiny, basically. Uh So these very small decisions, these very small, um, skillful actions in the smallest sense build up to larger things as well. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But one has to be astute enough in their meditation to even be able to notice the craving, right? Coming back to meditation, I feel as though if you don't Mm -hmm. even have that vantage point, or you don't, you're not honed in on your attention. Uh, and this is a symptom of a lot of us in the lay life, especially the cravings come and go, and we don't even know how destructive they are. You know, we act upon <laughs> the cravings and we don't even know what we're doing to ourselves. I think you actually described this in a recent yep. video, um, very eloquently where like, we don't even, we don't even know what we're doing to ourselves here. Oh, you talked about KFC and how you used to love KFC and used to get sick <laughs> every time you ate KFC. <laughs> And uh, you'd be like, why did I do this to myself? You'd regret it, right? And then six months later, you get the craving of KFC and go get it again. It's because we don't even, we don't know, like we don't learn our lesson essentially from what the craving is doing and the after effects of these cravings and attachments that we have. And yeah, if you don't, I feel as though if you're not in tune with yourself enough, you don't have that sense of concentration, you're going to keep eating KFC. You're going to keep eating the cookie when you shouldn't eat the cookie. (laughs) So, yeah, (laughs) just point of the story is, yeah, meditation, I feel as though is very important to just develop that mental muscle to be able to notice. We don't notice, you know, it's kind of just like we're on autopilot. And uh, Mm -hmm. I feel as though gradually that's the path is to come into a sense of noticing what we're doing to ourselves. That's what I like about Buddhism, man, is that it sows the seed of true self-accountability. It's just you. Mm -hmm. You're going to save yourself not Jesus, Mm. you know, uh, Mm -hmm. not anybody else from the outside, no false idol. You are the idol within and you hold the keys to your own liberation. That's what I uh, love about Buddhism is that it's, it's all about you in this thing. And if you really want to liberate yourself, congratulations, Mm -hmm. you're going to be the one to do it, but you're also going to be the one to jail yourself in your own attachment. So Mm. it's up to you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, man. So you can keep eating the KFC if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you'll be the one who suffers from it yep. the next day. <laughs> going to reap the karma. Exactly. Yeah. That's what's so special about the Buddhism's description of life. And like I said, the strategy guide is it's, uh, it's really all up to us. You know, we are mm-hmm. the arbiter of our own journey here and how we decide to play this game. And I do fully believe mm-hmm. that. And I feel like that is when you really truly start to believe in the Buddha's words. Like the Buddha is really just trying to say like, he's given us the keys. He's given us everything that we need, but do you want to tread this path? It's up to you. It's up to all of us in our own accord to be able to, to know that the Buddha was right essentially. And to follow those words with an earnest, uh, with an earnest, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just to know that that's it. Like that's the way to go about it. It's all about you. Mm-hmm. You save yourself. You save yourself, man. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, nobody else can do it for you, right? Yeah, yeah. there's something so noble in that. It's a noble mm-hmm. eightfold path. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, damn. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's it's liberating. It's also a sense of responsibility, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That could seem harrowing because I feel as though in one way or the other, we're somehow looking for some kind of savior, whether it's from other people, whether it's from some deity or it's from a cookie or KFC, (laughs) you know, something to save us or ultimately distract us from our suffering that essentially creates more suffering. But either way, we're Mm -hmm. like, we're looking for something outside of ourselves that is going to quench this thirst, this tanha, right? Tanha is that Mm -hmm. thirst? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And uh it never adds up. It never adds up. <laughs> Do you feel as no though No matter how many times. Yeah, no matter how many times. It's like I mean eventually I guess we'll get the message. And that's what a lot of sages <laughs> say that suffering is ultimately what leads us to the path. Would you um agree in that regard that a suffering and the sense of dis-ease dukkha is what 
gets us started on the path. In other words, like we keep eating the cookie or the KFC or whatever the attachment is. And we're like, wait a second. There's some point that says in us, there's something that says in us, there's got to be another way. And uh, <laughs> the way is the middle way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a good question. And it can be. There's actually a sutta where the Buddha says that suffering either leads to bewilderment. In other words, people just get really depressed, can't see a way forward, and whatever happens based on these negative emotions, right? And I think many people have been in that state. The other way is that it leads to a search, which yes. is essentially a way to find a solution. So if it leads that person to a search, then it can start them on the Noble Eightfold Path. And actually, a lot of Westerners, I sometimes describe this to Sri Lankans here, because a lot of Westerners, when they come to Buddhism, when they finally, when they decide to do it, they become very devoted because they really remember all the reasons that they decided to do it. It wasn't anything cultural. There's no cachet to it. It was suffering. <laughs> yeah. It was suffering that drove them. And sometimes they had so much too, and they were still suffering. They had some very successful people. Um, so definitely it's an important point that suffering can lead us to the search and the search can lead us to Buddhism. Buddhism the Buddha has the answer for that. So it's a good point. Mm. I believe so. The opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Buddhism is the remedy, it seems. Maybe <laughs> not for all, but I think for many of us, it could be the remedy to the suffering. And in that way, the suffering is almost like a, a good thing, if you want to call it that. It's almost like it could be. <laughs> You know, it could be grace mm -hmm. if you want to use it in that way. If you want to transmutate that energy of suffering, like we said, it's all up to you. It's all up to us uh, if we want to. But um, yeah, it's a blessing. I feel if you want to use the word blessing, that we mm -hmm. are even able to access these teachings and the Dharma itself and be able to come on here and speak about it. You know, I'm talking to you miles away. You're in a you're across the world. This is yeah, an honor for me to be able to do this <laughs> and have this talk with you and tap in to the Buddhist teachings. It's a wonderful time to be alive. I feel as though this is the life. This is the lifetime. You know, we could have been born in a time, which many of us might have been, where there was no, there was no spark of Dharma at all in our lives. There was just darkness. We might have had lives where we didn't even know how to read. The fact that we were mm -hmm. born with so much knowledge at our fingertips, you know, so much just true wisdom from prophets like the Buddha. It's just mind boggling to me. You know, we take it for granted, but this is like, this is, mm. this is it, man. This take advantage of this. Anyone listening, I'm speaking <laughs> to myself, you know, I'm talking to my, I'm preaching to me. Take advantage of this <laughs> life that we have and the tools at our disposal to truly liberate oneself. From uh, from ourself, liberate <laughs> ourself from ourself, essentially, you know, <laughs> nibbana, <laughs> nibbana. Um, yeah. Other than that, I don't have anything else to say, man. I think probably wrap it up. We've said everything we needed to say. I appreciate yeah. you coming on here, Bonte Joe. Um, something about you. I think what it is is that you're um, you're just very relatable, and you have a very simple presentation to the Western mind of Dhamma. And I think that is, uh, that's just very needed, you know, to, to relate to monks. Because I think a lot of people that don't know any better, I mean, they see you with the robe and the shaved head and living in Sri Lanka with nothing at all. It's like, why? To the Western mindset and to the Western um, way of life, it's just totally foreign. It just doesn't make any sense. But if you can relate in a mm -hmm. way to people that make sense, then I think you can get through, you can get across um, the truth that the Buddha was trying to tell us that this is, this is the way if you truly want to find joy to the Western mind. So yeah, keep doing your thing, man. I really, uh, I really appreciate you coming on here. And uh, that's it. I don't have anything else to say. Thank you. Do you, yeah, have any, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you have any last words or anything you want to say? No, well, just, uh, yeah, Anamodana for the, uh, for the kind words. I mean, I, I had teachers who were themselves taught by teachers. So there is a living tradition of Buddhism. So I can't, uh, I can't claim, 
to have really kind of um, invented uh, invented. I was taught by Westerners who uh, were able to relate Buddhism in really accessible language. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm glad that you uh, asked these questions. There were many of them were uh, very penetrating, bringing mm -hmm. out the reasons why people uh, go to Buddhism and the difficulties in finding their way to the middle path and the the ultimate purpose for which we have it. So, I mean, as you mentioned, this is a really rare time. And uh, these are really excellent things to discuss. So I'm glad that you have me on here. So many merits. It's been nice to meet you and have a chat about these very important topics. For sure, Bonte. For sure. And I think you're also the only monk that I've found that has a Western name, Bonte Joe. That's also very <laughs> relatable. I like it. Bonte Joe. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, yeah. Keep doing your thing. I wish you all the best in the future. Maybe sometime we can tap in again because um, this was great. I feel like we just touched the tip of the iceberg. But until then, peace and love to you. Yeah. And peace and all love to anybody. You too. Thank you, Bonte Joe. <laughs> and I wish you okay. all the best. Okay. You too. Peace.